Before we resume, I would like to announce our second prize winner who will be the lucky recipient of the $300 StubHub gift card. And the winner is Bill Dugdale. Is Bill here? Do you see him? Perfect. All right, congratulations. You can go redeem your prize at uh, the registration desk. Uh, after we're finished here. Um, all right, we are heading into the final segment of our program where we're gonna hear from two leaders about the impact sports can have in communities. We've seen some amazing examples of innovations that are benefiting athletes and fans, but on a larger scale, how can investing in sports spur economic growth at the city level and create positive social change? Well, I'm honored to be interviewing our next speaker, Benita Fitzgerald Mosley. And before she takes the stage, let's take a look back at her gold medal moment. 100 meter hurdles, a very, very highly competitive race. Benita Fitzgerald Brown will certainly be one lady to watch in lane four. Won the gold at the Pan American Games, her all time best 12.84. First of all, as I watch that video, that is so exciting. What must be going through an athlete's mind when you are on the starting line? So a couple things your coaches always tell you, and main thing is run your own race. You gotta focus on the finish line, you gotta focus on your own race. As you can see, I only won, I should say only, separate, <laughs> separated from the gold and silver, but four hundredths of a second. Um, and I had an even closer race at the Olympic trials in 84. I won, uh, I made that team by one one hundredth of a second. Four of us crossed the finish line pretty much virtually at the same time, one one hundredth of a second. It was the closest race in track and field history at the time. And so I'm used to close races and so the, the final piece of advice that your coach always gives you is run through the finish line. Don't ever take anything for granted. Don't start celebrating, you know, yeah. yards before the finish because somebody might out lean you. That's great advice, but not only did you win the gold medal, you also made history. You were the first African-American woman to win a gold medal. In, that not only is hurdles, in yeah. the 100-meter hurdles. I mean, you really like set the pace for women, you know, to look up to you and be an inspiration to others. So that's incredible and right we there. Had a, I don't know if uh, many of you saw this past summer, well, in Rio, uh, three women, American women, uh, swept the 100-meter hurdles. Did they? At the Rio Olympic Games, the first time that event's been swept by Americans ever in history. So we went from me, the first, to then three African-American women going one, two, three gold, silver, bronze. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. We're going to talk more about your career, but as you mentioned that, you worked for the USOC. I did. And let's talk about what you did. So in 1984, you know, you win the gold medal for the 100 meter hurdles, um, but then you go on to work with the Olympics. Right. In, uh, tell me a little bit about the London Games and what your responsibilities were and what you brought to that team of your own, this new team that right. you created, and what you did. So I uh, was the chief of uh, sport performance for USA Track and Field for four years, uh, about three years preceding the London Olympics through the World Championships in 2013. 
and we won 29 medals at the London Olympic Games. Um, I was in charge of sports science and medicine, coaching, athlete support, um, all of the team USA management for the entire men's and women's track and field team, which is about 130 athletes, plus a staff, uh, extra people around, about 200, 225 people uh, that you gotta move from one place to another. And we did a lot of new sports science and medicine uh, programs. We uh, reorganized the athlete support that we were giving and redirected it to make sure it was getting to the right athletes for the right reasons. We uh, again revamped our coach support and coach stipends and the access that they had to their athletes uh, throughout the year, but particularly at Worlds and at the Olympic Games. And finally, Team USA management was the key. I remember watching the Beijing Olympics where we, we really underperformed, which is one of the reasons I was hired uh, a year later. Uh, they, I remember the, the men's and women's four by one relay team lining up for the, the semifinals. Neither team made the final. And they had handwritten numbers, uh, USA, on their chest because the, the team manager never picked up the bibs for the team. And so one had to handwrite it and put on a piece of paper. So it was those kinds of things that throw the athletes off. And when the management, team management, isn't up to par, gold medal, right. then the, it's hard for the athletes to win medals as well. Right, you allow the athletes to focus on what right. they do best. So we, we streamlined that process, we um, found people who uh, had experience and we kept those people throughout the four years. Uh, that went with the medical staff as well. Um, so yeah, we, we ended up uh, blowing out of the water. We had the, the best performance in 20 years. That's incredible, well, congratulations to you, that's amazing. Um, so you had a great career as an athlete you have a great career putting together your own team and helping Team USA go on to win 29 medals. Let's fast forward today, so then you become the CEO of Laureus. Yeah, Laureus Sport for Good Foundation. Our, our mission is to change the lives of youth and strengthen communities through the power of sport. And um, you know we we are focused on really four outcome areas. So you know sports sticky. You know kids love it. They want to participate. Uh, oftentimes they uh, start as as young people. Obviously, uh, some aspire to be Olympic gold medalists or professional athletes. But most of us just want to you know mostly uh, participate in sports, be healthy, be part of a team. Uh, I was talking uh, to. Um, Jennifer earlier with the NFL, and I was reminding her that Ernst and Young did a study that girls who participate in sport, um, you know, obviously participate and, and get better grades in school and all that, but 94% of women executives participated in college sports when they were younger. That's a great And story. so, yeah, so we are looking at uh, youth, sports-based youth development, essentially, and the outcomes we're trying to use sport to achieve, both for the, for the young person, particularly in um, low-income areas, uh, but also for their communities around health and wellness, around education, employment, and what we call social cohesion, which is really reducing youth violence and increasing uh, diversity within communities and bringing communities to rally around sport and sport-based youth development uh, in uh, pursuit of community-wide goals that they're trying to achieve. So I was in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago speaking with a group of um, corporate leaders and we talked as much about Laureus as we did about the goals that New Orleans has for that community. They want to grow, they want to retain talent, talented young people in the community. They want to re reduce violence in their city. Um, many people don't know, but per capita, they have more murders in New Orleans than in New York or Baltimore or Chicago. And so those statistics, when you have a you know education system that's not hasn't really rebounded since Katrina, when you have a parks and rec system um, that is still struggling to get you know uh, facilities back online, um, those situations impact the youth in that community. 
then those youth end up you know, not pursuing their educational goals appropriately. They are on the streets, they're getting involved in, in activities that they shouldn't be involved in. And what we know is that kids that participate in sports, we've trained and placed 8,000 coaches, uh, really coach mentors in sports programs around the country. We've impacted over half a million kids in the last four or five years. And we're focused now on creating uh, programs in communities, so Sport for Good New Orleans, Sport for Good Atlanta, and we'll be rolling out Sport for Good New York and Chicago in January. Um, but what we understand is that when we put together a coalition, a cross-sector coalition that includes uh, a pursuit of citywide goals, but also how to use sport to achieve those goals through uh, these sport-based youth development programs. So we fund these programs, we help them build capacity, we build coalitions so that they're collaborating where the whole is better than the, greater than the sum of its parts, and then we ultimately are achieving these goals that will help cities, uh, again, create young people and develop young people into really great citizens in their communities. What a great program. So Laureus really funds all of the different programs. Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, and in these cities, we, are, we are act as a backbone for a collective impact. Um, strategy and we're in those cities for the long haul we're going to be in New Orleans for 10 years we're going to be in Atlanta which we launched in July uh, for 10 years and then we're taking that model and what we've learned about citywide impact and building these community coalitions to New York and Chicago hopefully soon LA Houston uh, our goal is to be in 20 cities by the end of 2020 it's a very lofty goal but I'm fast right I'm a, I, I'm a sprinter <laughs> I'm an athlete, I have a feeling so. you can get this done yeah um, let's go back a little bit how Laureus was founded. I know Nelson Mandela has a connection to this. He does. Our founder is uh, Johan Rupert. He's the founder of a company called Richemont and they are a luxury goods company. They um, own Piaget and um, Cartier, Mont Blanc and Van Cleef and Arpels and, and many, many other luxury brands and he's a South African and when he uh, was you know, home, he was in South Africa during the Invictus story. Many of you have seen the movie with uh, Morgan Freeman and Matt Damon uh, depicting the South African rugby team that won the World Cup. And at the time that Nelson Mandela had just been elected president of this country that was certainly r still racially divided. And the blacks and whites came together to cheer on their, their rugby team. And he saw the power of sport heal a nation. And he thought, I want to celebrate the power of sport and the excellence in sport. So he created the Laureus World Sports Awards in 2000 the very first one in Monaco, and, and Nelson Mandela, friends of, of Johann Rupert for many years, he invited him to speak, and he, he uh, spoke and said that sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport creates hope where once there was only despair. And he spoke those words, and many people you know, hear them or por portions of that quote, but it, they were actually spoken at the very first Laureus World Sports Awards. So we have the World Sports Awards that happen every year, celebrating the best uh, athletes and teams in the world. And we have about 200 ambassadors and academy members who are iconic athletes in their own right. Uh, four of them are on my board. Marcus Allen from football, Edwin Moses, one of my teammates in track and field, uh, Michael Johnson, who came in a little after me uh, with the golden shoes, and Nadia Kamenich, the, the iconic gymnast. Those and so, the yeah, they're all on my, on my board at, of Laureus USA, and they help inform you know, the programming that we do, and they, among you know, the 200 athletes around the world, really lend their name and their likeness and their, their time and energy to really 150 projects around the world. So I'm Laureus USA, but I'm part of nine national foundations that are serving in 35 different countries. Wow. And so we, are, we have a big footprint. Uh, those athletes that gathered together in 2000 were so impressed and impacted by Nelson Mandela's words that they founded the, the foundation. And it's really had an impact 
on millions of kids around the world, creating peace in the Middle East and you know, introducing kids to sports and experiences that they otherwise couldn't and wouldn't have. Sport really is powerful. I mean, the, it's proof right there. And I think we need more programs like this. So for something to get involved for our audience here today, um, if they wanna get involved, what is the best way? I know, are there websites? And I know there's a new program too that you yeah. introduced as well, but let's you know engage people how to contribute to this or how to support it and get involved because right. I think it is truly important that more programs like this are supported because it is having such a great impact on youth, the communities, and thank you for being involved in this and it's taking what you've learned yeah. you know, I, along the way. My passion has been to you know, help others achieve gold medals in their lives, just like I got to on the track, and um, what better way to do that than influencing young people and communities, so it's fun. Yeah, we have a website, laureususa.com. You can follow us on Twitter, um, at laureus underscore USA. And then, if you would like to get more information, uh, we're gonna be launching a Sport for Good League in January, and uh, as we roll these chapters out around the country, we're creating membership, online resources, and and this Sport for Good League will encompass all of that. And so uh, if you go to map.lauriususa.com, map.lauriususa.com, then uh, you can sign up. And when we launch in January, you'll be flooded. Your inbox will be not, not <laughs> flooded, but you'll be getting information as to how to access the league. That's which is a, fun. Yeah, that's exciting. So what's next for you? What are, what are your hopes for the future? Yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, we're, we're really wanting to, um, to grow this community impact through sport. And we, we are looking you know, at part, various partnerships. Uh, you know, I'm talking to the US Olympic Committee, in, internationally talking to the IOC. We are um, partnering with uh, organizations like Let's Move, Active Schools. Uh, we have new corporate partners like Nike that are joining us in, in Sport for Good News. New York, and so the, that, those funding and those strategic alliances are helping us grow in a, at a faster pace because we really feel like we want to elevate the conversation about how sport can be used as a tool for social change. And I think we all inherently, those of us who've participated in sport, understand the personal lessons that we learn and how we develop, you know, from a teamwork and perseverance and all of that. Clearly, women executives have figured that out. Um, but we uh, also know that that the, the, the communities need to have this develop, you know, community development as well, and we think sport is, is a tool for that. In Atlanta in particular, uh, again, having just just launched in, in July, we are really focused on uh, the education sector in three neighborhoods in the west side, which most of us saw the brand new Mercedes-Benz Stadium uh, open a couple of weeks ago. And these neighborhoods are in the shadow of the stadium, and Mercedes-Benz is one of our top, in addition to Richmond, top uh, sponsors. And so they wanted to ensure that even though they're building this big, beautiful stadium, that that along with the Arthur Blank and, and the Falcons, obviously, that we are really in service to those communities that surround it. And so these kids are, are gonna benefit from sports programs, 14 different sports programs that we're funding in Atlanta. And, uh, and a broader coalition of sports organizations. So these organizations were either already operating in the West Side or, uh, or they are using the funding to take what they're already doing in the greater Atlanta to these, this, this neighborhood. And again, it's another neighborhood plagued with crime, uh, one of the highest crime neighborhoods in the, in the country, most underserved, and, um, and we want to, you gotta go you know, where the problems start, and that's kids at a young age and providing them a different path. And so we think through sport, they can find that different path. That is so wonderful. Well, thank you for doing what you do. You are having such an impact in communities, in these kids' lives, and in all of our lives. So um, I just want to thank you for being here and for sharing everything that was very insightful. And I'm sure that we all learned a lot from this. Um, so what we're going to... Th I think I want to say one more huh? thing. I know uh, many of you, Chamber of Commerce, I've served on a couple of chambers in Colorado Springs and in Northern Virginia as well. And I know we're talking about business development, economic development oftentimes. And again, as I was talking with these corporate leaders in, in New Orleans, uh, they really see uh, youth development as being a key to driving future um, economic development for their town. And so as we're thinking about how sports can be a catalyst for economic development, I think um, sport for good needs to be considered as well.
Benita, thank you so much. This has been insightful and inspiring. And uh, up next, we have our final speaker, Gregory O'Dell. But before he takes the stage, we're gonna look at a video. Thank you, Benita. Thank you.